Good to see all of you this morning. Thank you for being here as we worship God together. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of visitors today uh, and a lot of familiar faces, so it's good to see you. Thank you for being here as well. Uh, as always, ask, hang around just a little bit after so we can get to know you a little bit. So thank you all for being here. Uh, I invite you to take out your Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 1. I don't have a PowerPoint today, but I have a very simple outline, so I think it'll be okay. But in Proverbs chapter 1... Verse 7, Solomon gives us his first proverb. And he introduces himself in the first six verses. But in verse 7, he gives us the first proverb of Proverbs. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. There's the first proverb. Obviously a very important proverb. You know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. And then in verse 8, we have our second proverb. Another very important proverb. My son, hear the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. And he's telling his son, if you remember what I taught you, and if you remember what your mother taught you, you can carry those things with you. And you can take them with you throughout your whole life, and they'll be like a crown on your head. They'll be like a necklace around, uh, you know, your neck, a necklace around your neck. And you can carry them wherever you go. You can take your mother and father with you because you remember their words. And so obviously today being what it is, I was hitting on these proverbs about the ways that we carry our mother and our father with us when we go and about our, our life without them uh, or a life not living under their house anymore. And so what let me do is first in my intro, let me give you two examples of two people that were mindful that they carried their mother with them. And if you're going to notice that these two examples are complete opposites of each other. The first one is I've got from 1818. John Quincy Adams. He's the sixth president of the United States. His father's John Adams, the second president of the United States, the founding father, John Adams. And I'm always inclined to kind of go to the Adams family, either be John or his wife Abigail or their son Quincy, because they're very godly-minded people. And it comes, that comes out in their letters. In 1818, when John Quincy has already served as president, and he's in his 50s, Abigail, his, his mother, dies. And Abigail was very influential on her husband, John, and very influential on her son, John Quincy Adams. So her husband was president, and her son also was president, right? He wrote this in his diary entry the night that she died. And if I let me read that to you really quickly. It's very short. And notice here, this is written in 1818, so some of the language is very different. John Quincy Adams talking about Abigail. He says, My mother was an angel upon this earth. She was a minister of blessing to all human beings within her sphere of action. Her heart was the abode of heavenly purity. She handled feelings but of kindness and beneficence. Yet her mind was as firm as her temper was mild and gentle. She had known sorrow, but her sorrow was silent. She was acquainted with grief but it was deposited in her own bosom. She was the real personification of female virtue, of piety, of charity, of ever active and never intermitting benevolence. Oh God, could you not have spared her just a little longer? My lot in life has been almost always cast as a distance from her. I enjoyed her, but for just a short seasons and at long distant intervals, the happiness of her society. Yet she has been to me more than a mother. She has been a spirit from above watching over me for good and contributing by my mere consciousness of her existence to the comfort of my life. That consciousness is now gone, and without her, the world feels to me like a solitude. Oh, what it must be to my father, and how we support life without her who has been to him his charm. Not my will, Heavenly Father, but thy and be done. And it's really beautiful what he says about his mother here. But something that I really took notice of is when he says, this woman, you know, my mother, she was more to me than just my mother. He says, she was my spirit. She was my conscience. And, and, and he goes on to say, you know, that like when I'm serving, you know, in these big famous political offices and I'm, and I'm going about day to day, all I can hear is my mother's voice in my head telling me, do this. Yeah, that's a good thing to do. Or telling me, no, no, you need to stay away from this. And he says, you know, how pain he is now that his conscience, in a sense, has left the earth. 
And of course that's not true. In Proverbs we see you can continue to carry them with you. But what he makes the point overall here is that his mother was his conscience. His mother was his conscience. Now let me give you a second example. Kanye West. The very opposite of John Quincy Adams, right? I don't watch uh, music or celebrity award shows because I have a life. But on one of these celebrity award shows, Taylor Swift won an award. And she goes up there and she starts talking, thank you for you know, giving me this award. And what does Kanye West do? He jumps up and he takes the mic from Taylor and he says, you know, I'm going to let you finish, but Beyonce had the best music video ever. And when he does this, this happened several years ago. Maybe you all remember it if you do watch these celebrity awards or saw it on YouTube or something. It was just very rude that he would do this to to this young female artist, right? That he would interrupt her and and tell basically everyone in the room that y'all shouldn't have given this person this award. You should have given it to somebody else. It was very, very rude. Next couple of days later, if you know this, Kanye West was on The Tonight Show when Jay Leno was doing The Tonight Show. And Jay wanted to ask him about what he had done a couple of nights ago to Taylor Swift. And what Jay Leno asked to Kanye West, of all people, he says, would your mother have approved of what you did to Taylor? What would have your mother said if she knew what you did the other night? And what does Kanye West start doing? It's not in HD, so it's hard to tell. He starts crying. He starts crying on live television. And and why? Because even someone like John Quincy Adams and even someone like Kanye West, on both ends of the spectrum, what do they both feel about their mother? Their mother is their conscience. And and I figured, you know, after watching that years ago, if Jay Leno can do this to people, I can do this to people. And so when, like, you know, I'm in studying with someone and, and they're denying what's going on and they're lying to me and they're pretending like, oh, yeah, I'm not in sin. I'm not doing these things, Andrew. Or they even try to argue that God approves of the things that they're doing, the way they live. You know what I drop sometimes? The same line Jay Leno told to Kanye West. Sometimes I say, well, would your mother approve of the things that you're doing? Would your mother approve the life that you're living? And often, more times than not, the next thing I see is tears. And, you know, their eyes start, you know, getting red and they start doing this number. And we do this too. And it's because most of us, you know, in a general sense, we consider our mother to be our conscience. And that's because of the teaching she did when we were young. And so I want to kind of explore that with you. I just have two things. First, let's look at some of the Proverbs that talk about this. And then at the end, we'll talk about our mothers instilling faith in us. And we'll get some New Testament passages and we'll come back to the Proverbs. At the very end, I want to wrap things up with reading a verse about how God is is especially, you know, our conscience. In many ways. So let's do this with me, if you will. Uh, If we look here at Proverbs 29, if you want to start there, just three things here. Proverbs 29. As I said, our mother is our conscience, and this is because she's usually the one with us when we're at a very, very young age. In our earliest memories of learning between right and wrong, she's the one that instructed us about these things, right? If we go to a restaurant and we see, you know, strangers, people we don't know, it is obviously very different if you're the mother of these children. But you go into a restaurant or a public place and you see very, very well-behaved children. You know, they're not running around. They're able to sit down with their hands in their lap. They're not hitting each other. They're not grabbing things. They're just being quiet and respectful. And we see those children we don't know. Do do we think, okay, well, you know what? These kids woke up this morning and they thought, you know, I'm going to do right. And I'm going to be a good kid. And I'm going to make all these good decisions today. Is that our first thing that comes to our mind? I don't think it is. I think usually when we see children we don't know, the first thing that comes to mind when we see nice, respectful children is, wow, they've got a good mom. That's usually the first thing that comes to mind. And I understand that's not always true. I understand that kids have bad days. There's a lot of good moms that every once in a while have a kid that runs away from them. I understand all that. But generally speaking, we see good little children. We think these people have good moms. Proverbs 29, 15, if you're there, this is what the proverb says. Proverbs 29, 15. Let me read that one. 15. Verse 15, the rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to who? His mother. In a lot of ways, you think about little children, whose responsibility is this? It's the parents. 
And if you have little children that, you know, and I understand again that they're still humans. They have bad days. They have good days. They're not perfect. I understand all that. But in general sense, if they're bad little kids, whose fault is that? Less their mother and their father's fault, right? On the oppositely, when they're good and they're respectful and they actually can sit quietly in church, and I know that's not easy for all of us to do, and you actually can make your kids sit quiet for 30 minutes, who brings, does that bring glory to? That brings glory to his mother or her mother, right? How do you do this, though? How do you instill this wisdom into your children to behave? It says in verse 15, the rod and rebuke give wisdom. My mama would have read it like this. The wooden spoon and rebuke give wisdom, right? And because when our mothers are willing to discipline us, and when our mothers are willing to tell us right from wrong for a very little age, she gives us her wisdom. And that wisdom she instills in us in a very young age becomes our conscience when we grow up, right? Now, mothers and fathers, what's your reward for instilling this wisdom into your children? It's in verse 17. Correct your son... And he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. That's the reward. That you can be delighted in your children's good behavior because you've instilled this wisdom into them. Second thing here. Let's go to Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22. Imagine a lot of you already know the passage I'm going to read. Again, I don't think it's an overall principle that's always true in every situation. I believe that there's good parents that sometimes have children that grow up and make bad choices, and I believe that there's bad parents that somehow end up raising good children. But in verse 6, look at this, chapter 22, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So when he's older... He's not going to depart from your way because you trained him when they were a child. And when does that start? When is training up a child in the way he should go start? That starts when they're starting to walk and talk when they're babies. That's when that training begins. And where does that training usually come from? It comes from their mama. And their mama there at that very, very young age instills values that will last them a lifetime. That's a very powerful thought, right? When I first started preaching, uh, and I would go to these different churches, and even when I was first starting here, you know, I'd get done with my sermon, and I'd go down there and talk to people. And people would say usually the same thing. They'd say, Andrew, your mother would be proud. Or, you know, Andrew, your parents would be proud. And, of course, it's, it's a very nice compliment, right? And, and you say, thank you for, for saying that, and you keep on going. I usually don't like it because it's a conversation killer. You know, someone came up to me and said, Andrew, your parents would be proud. Like, what am I supposed to say next? Like I said, like, just say, thank you. I can't say, oh, well, yes, they are. <laughs> you know, I, I can't do that. What have you done today to make your parents proud? <laughs> you know, like, I, it's a conversation killer, but it is a compliment that we say to each other. And, and why is that? That's because the way that you act today in your older state is a reflection of the training that your mother and your father gave you when you were young. Right? And that's what we see in verse 6. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You can turn to Proverbs 17, but I'm going to read out of Luke 11 real quick. This thought of, we tell people, your parents would be proud of the way that you act, or or they would be proud of the thing that you've done. This is very similar, I think, to what the woman yells out to Jesus in Luke 11. In Luke 11, if you remember this in verse 27, Jesus is doing this teaching, and all of a sudden there, there's like this random lady cries on the crowd. It says, and it happened as he spoke these things, talking about Jesus, that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. Now to be fair, that statement is true. Mary was blessed. And Elizabeth says through the power of John the Baptist when he He's still in our womb. Elizabeth sees Mary and says, you are blessed among women. We see that early on in the book of Luke. However, Jesus you know, quickly corrects her. Again, I think it's because it's a conversation killer. And says, you know, that's good. But more blessed are those who keep, you know, hear my word and do it. Right? Those are the more blessed people. But when I think about Luke 11 and 27 in our context, what is this lady trying to do? Is she trying to compliment Mary? Or is she trying to compliment Jesus? When she says, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. In our context, I believe she's trying to bless Jesus. 
She's saying your mama is blessed because she has you. Your mother is blessed because she created you. Now, to be fair, Mary is blessed for having Jesus, right? And Mary was a great mother. I'm not trying to take that away from all. But was Jesus so good and amazing and powerful because of Mary? I don't think so. I think Mary really aided in his work in that. But Jesus was amazing and incredible because he was the son of God, right? However, the point we see is true, that we say this to each other, your mother is blessed because she has you. That's a compliment to you, right? And what is this lady, what's her reasoning behind saying this? She's saying your mother did a good job raising you, and that's the way why you are the way you are. It probably wasn't exactly true for Jesus, but it would be true for all of us if we said that to each other. If you're here in Proverbs 17, 6, here would be more talking about grandfathers and grandmothers, but it says in Proverbs 17, 6, Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children is their father. So when you're able to raise up children that are faithful and you do such a good job raising them in faith that they go out and have their own children and they raise them up with wisdom and faith, what does that say about you? That means that you're blessed. And those grandchildren that are good, they are your crown, right? They are your crown and your glory. And the children revere you. And they say, no, you're my glory because you're the ones that instill these values in me, right? And again, all of this goes back to what? Your mother is your conscience because of the work that she put forth. Proverbs 31, 28. We're familiar with this passage. Proverbs 31, 28. Talking about the virtuous woman. This is what the children are supposed to do. It says, her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all, right? And obviously, how do children rise up and call their mother blessed? Well, they actually say it, right? Like they actually vocalize it. They call them blessed. But why is the reason why their children call them blessed? It's verse 27. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Being a mother, or even being a father too, is that an easy job or a hard job? That's a hard job, right? When we think back when we were younger and the things that we put our mothers through, I don't know if my mother always knew where I was. I don't know how many hours my mother spent trying to go and just find where Andrew was, right? Who knows what I was up to? And she would have to go in there and find me and correct it and stop it and chase me around the kitchen with a wooden spoon, right? She had to do those things, right? Do you think mom enjoyed that? Well, don't you think mama would have liked to sleep a little bit more? I think she would have. But she made the decision not to eat the bread of idleness. And because she gave so much of her energy to you, she's been able to raise you up to a wise and godly person. And now she has instilled herself as your conscience. And what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to rise up and call our mother's blessing. Is that just on Mother's Day? Of course not. That's supposed to be every day, right? And so let me move into my my second stage here, and and let's talk about mothers laying this foundation. My second point here. If you're on your way to Timothy, but we're not there yet, go go to the Psalms. Go to the Psalms. I guess that'd actually be going backwards, though, wouldn't it? Let's go to the Psalms 127. This is kind of... You know, first we kind of directed this all to to us being children, but now let's kind of direct this more to to what mothers are instructed to do. Mothers and fathers, you have something powerful if you have children. And the psalmist here is trying to make that point. He says in verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, because, but shall speak with their enemies at the gate. These children are a heritage from the Lord, and they're like quiver. You know, they're like arrows in the quiver of an archer. And I think the idea here is that as individuals, we have a limited range of influence, right? 
I'm going to live this many years and I'm going to see this many people and that's my limited range of influence. But the psalmist here says if you have children and you can instill your values into them, you expand your range. And that's where the idea of an archer comes in, right? Because an archer, he has an extended range. You know, you're at the, enemy, you're at the gate, your enemies are coming against your, your fortress, your walls. Well, if you're an archer, you can stand up on the gate and pop that guy right there. And you can protect yourself from your enemies because you have an extended range. That's what children do for us in the earth. Children extend our range into a next generation or meet people that we don't meet, and they can instill those values into those people as well. Some people say today that our world is so evil now that that Christians just need to stop having children because there is no way you can raise a faithful child in this day and age. There's a lot of problems with that statement. For one, evil has always been. And Solomon flat out said in Ecclesiastes, do not say the golden days were golden because they weren't. Imagine Noah. When did he raise his children? Noah raised faithful children in a day when the world was so evil, God was like, I'm going to kill them all, except for Noah and his children. If Noah could do that, I believe the Lord has equipped us to do that. What the psalmist says here in 127, that in an evil age, when there are enemies at the gate, what are we actually should be doing? We should be having children and training them up in the admission of the Lord so they can be our weaponry. They can be your arrows to fend off the wages of evil and the enemies at the gates, right? So mothers and fathers, do we not have an important job? And our warfare against the enemy can be used through our training of our children. This is extremely important here, as I see in Psalm 127. Let's go to Timothy, 2 Timothy, if you will. And we'll go back to just Proverbs in just a second. Second Timothy, if you'll first go to chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, and let me read this. You know, in verse 4, 13, Paul says, you know that there's evil men out there, and they're getting worse and worse. And so he's doing the same thing in Psalm 127. He's like, Timothy, you need to take charge and be ready to fight off this evil. In verse 14, this is how Timothy's going to do it. He says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, Knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And of course we know this one. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for the instruction of the righteous, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped from every good work. I used to read verse 14 often, and I would think, you know, Paul says, you must continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. You know, continue in the things you've been taught, Timothy, because you know who you got them from. And my first thought was always like, well, this is Paul. Paul's the one that taught Timothy. Paul's saying, you remember me. And that definitely could be part of it. But then I connected this passage to what Timothy, what Paul says in Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verse 5. Chapter 1 of this book, verse 5. You know, he says he's greatly desiring to see Timothy. And then verse 5 he says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded it is in you also. That's how he begins this letter. I know about the faith of Eunice and Lois, and I'm persuaded that they got that faith and they put it in you. But then we go back to chapter 3 thinking about that, and we read verse 14. Chapter 3, verse 14 again. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. Who is the people you know of? The people that taught you. The things that you must continue in. The people that taught you from childhood of the Holy Scriptures. Well, that was his mother and his grandmother, right? Right? And when he's telling Timothy, you need to press on and you need to you know, work hard and do the work of an evangelist and do the things that I've told you to do. He says, remember the ones who taught you this. And that's his mother and his grandmother. Because they too are Timothy's conscience. Because they're the ones that instill those values from a young age. And that's the reason why we can say to each other, you know, would your mother approve of this? And people start crying. 
Because they're the ones that first taught us these things, and they hold a special place in our heart. We have those memories, right? Well, what did our mothers teach us? And let's go back to Proverbs 31 and talk about that for just a second. I think there's three things that the woman here teacher teaches in Proverbs 31 to her son. Proverbs 31, we meet King Lemuel, and we don't have a clue who he is. But he says that these are the things that his mother taught him. A lot of people want to know who King Lemuel is, and and Jewish tradition gives us two options. And this is just something for you to think about. Probably the more popular tradition is that this is Solomon. And King Lemuel, Lemuel just means devoted to God. And this is Bathsheba that's telling Solomon these things. And I'm fine with that. The other thought is that this is Hezekiah's mom, Abijah. We know that Hezekiah must have had someone influential in his life because it definitely wasn't his dad, King Hayaz. But day one, King Hezekiah goes and he restores the temple. So obviously someone was instilling faith in Hezekiah. And being that tradition says that Hezekiah is the one that assembled the Proverbs, like he went and found Solomon's Proverbs and he put them together in a book and published them, they thought is that maybe Hezekiah wrote the last chapter here of Proverbs. And this is his mother, Abijah, speaking. I think Bathsheba or Abijah would both be good women to put here. Look here in verse 1 of chapter 31. The words of King Lemuel, the utterance which his mother taught him. What my son, and what son of my womb, and what son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to which destroy kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, is it not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law. And pervert the justice of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who's perishing. And wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Open your mouth for the speechless. And the cause of all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth, judge righteously. And plead the cause of the poor and needy. And then he goes into who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far more than rubies. We're more familiar with that section of Proverbs 31. The mother here of King Lemuel, I think, teaches him three principles here at a very early age. And, you know, King Lemuel, he's trying to tell us these are important things that my mother taught me. The first one here is do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to the which destroy kings in verse 3. And I think what he's saying here. And what she's saying here is you need to have enough self-control when it comes to the opposite sex that you can make good decisions, right? And what does that say to us as mothers and our sons that have mothers, especially of us that are having to make decisions about the women that we're around and the women that we date and the women that we hope soon to marry? I think that means that as mothers, we need to be communicating to our young men about finding a spouse, There needs to be a lot of conversation about that. And I think as well, it needs to be coming from the mother. I remember several times, in a very general sense, you know, when I was like 16 years old and I have a clue what I was doing. And I remember mother coming and talking to me and saying, you know, Andrew, you should have invited, you know, whoever was the girlfriend, you should have invited her this weekend to go spend time with you with other guys. And I go, but mama, she didn't want to go. I know she doesn't want to go. And mom goes, no, it doesn't matter. If you care about her, you're going to let her make that decision for herself. And there was some little general wisdom there. Okay, you know, I should communicate to whoever my girlfriend is is and say, hey, you know what, would you like to come with me? And she says, no, I would not like to go, but at least she feels like she matters and she cares, which she should. You should care about her, right? Mother gives some wisdom about how to handle those situations that I certainly didn't know until she told me. You think about more serious stuff. What about if your mother came to you and you're a 16-year-old boy, 18-year-old boy? Your mom comes to you and says, Andrew, that girl that you're spending time with, she's bad news. Do you take her advice seriously? Do you have a conversation with her about that? Are you willing to leave a certain girl that might be very attractive because your mother thinks, I think she's going to steer you in a bad path? I think, number one, moms, you need to be telling those things to your children. And I think, young men, you need to listen to your mom about that. Because King Lemuel certainly did. I think the same could be said for fathers talking to their daughters about who they're dating. This is something that needs to be taught, and it needs to come from that parent, right? King Lemuel's mother did that, and he appreciated it growing up. Secondly, here he talks about intoxicating drink, that his mother taught him about that. Why do people drink intoxicating drinks? 
Or why do people intoxicate themselves? It's verse 5. Lest they drink and forget. I think a lot of times the reason why people go to these things is because they're trying to forget. And it might be stuff really bad that they're trying to forget, and they're, they're going to the wrong solution for that. But she says what the problem is with forgetting because of intoxicating drink. She says, if you drink the intoxicating drink and you get drunk, you will forget the law. And you will go and you will pervert justice and you will be a bad king. You know, when you think about growing up, who's the first person that taught you about alcohol? Who's the first person that taught you about drugs? It probably you don't remember, but I bet it went something like this. You know, you got home from school one day or your mom picked you up in the car line. And you said, you know, Mom, we talked about someone who was drunk today. What does drunk mean? Or, or Mom, one of my friends said at school that, that his dad was drunk. What does that mean? As moms, you're the first person that's going to instill those values. And when they get to be 25 and they get to be 40 and they get to be 70, who are they going to think back to when they think about something like intoxicating drink? It's going to all start with what their mother first taught them about it. And you can be a powerful case against something like that. In verse 8, starting there, I think the final lesson here is that, King Lemuel, it is your job to defend the defenseless and to help the helpless and to be a voice to the needy. Now, when you walk by someone on the street that needs help and you completely ignore them, now, maybe if I thought, what would my mom want me to do in this situation? Often it would make us stop. And it would make us rethink about where our priorities are and if we're really trying to seek and help those that are in need. And it's because our mother first taught us. Obviously, who's the one that helped you the most when you were the most helpless you've ever been? It was your mom who helped you when you were the most helpless you've ever been. We are born not even able to move. You know, you see like a baby, you know, and and they've just been born. You know, are they walking around? Can they feed themselves? They can't do anything. They just lay there. The only reason why they make it from the next day to the next day is because their mom takes care of them. When you are in your most helpless state, your mother takes care of you. And now your mother is supposed to ask you and instill in your conscience to help those that are helpless as well. That's all I really have to say about mothers here. And obviously mothers need to be our conscience and to instill us for that. Don't put up your Bibles just yet. Let me share one more passage with you. And let me wrap things up and bring this to talk about God. In Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10. We've been talking about how by you living a certain way, you bring glory to your mother. And we say things like, your mother must be proud in the way that you live. There's something similar said about God here in Ephesians 3. In Ephesians 1, we meet two terms. One term is the principalities and powers. The other term we introduce to in chapter 1 is the heavenly places. The heavenly places is basically, no, don't think exactly heaven. The heavenly places is the spiritual realm. And because if you've been baptized in the Christ, you've been raised up to sit in the heavenly places with Jesus Christ. So you too have a seat in the spiritual realm if you're a Christian, right? As well, we meet these principalities and powers and think basically like the angelic beings that God has created that live in the spiritual realm. Uh, And you could even say that demons and Satan as well would fit into these principalities and powers that live in the heavenly places. All these other created beings that aren't humans. Starting here in chapter 3, verse 9, Paul says that he's been become the apostles for the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ, verse 9, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God and created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers In the heavenly places. What he says here is that the church has been given the manifold wisdom of God. He says here, verse 9, that the fellowship of the mystery, the gospel, has been revealed and the church has been created so that the principalities and powers in the heavenly places would look at the church, which is you and me, and say, wow, I can see the manifold wisdom of God. You think about this in the sense of like architecture. You know, we go and we see this beautiful building, and we're like, wow, this building is, is, is gorgeous, right? It has all these, like, interesting, like, you know, wooden carvings around it, and this marble, and all these wonderful things. And we think, wow, that architect who made this, that was a wise architect. We see the wisdom of the architect in the building, right? 
Or, or maybe like you have a very strong building and a hurricane blows through and all the buildings around are gone except for this one building. We see that one building and go, wow, there's a lot of wisdom in that architect. That architect had wisdom. We see the wisdom of the architect in the building. What God wants is for the principalities and powers in the heavenly places to look at his church and say, wow, there is wisdom in the architect of this church. We want the same thing for our mothers, right? We want to grow up and people to say, look at us and say, wow, I see the wisdom of Andrew's mother in him. And here we see we're supposed to be showing the wisdom of God in our life. So who are we trying to make proud here? Obviously, what do we want to make our parents proud with the way we live? But ultimately, as members of the church, the universal body, we're supposed to make God proud. And we're supposed to bring him glory when th- people, you know, even heavenly beings that don't live on this earth, they see the church and they go, wow, that's the wisdom of God. That he would come and lay down his life for these people that one day they could too sit in the heavenly places with him. That's powerful. So when you think about this, there's a lot of people watching you, right? There's people watching you and they're judging your mother and father by the way you act. There's also principalities and powers in the heavenly places that are watching you. And they might make judgments about God because of the way his people act. And obviously those are two of those people we want to please the most. Solomon wanted to please those people the most. His first two Proverbs was about fearing God and respecting his mother and his father. Right? Those are three people that we want to impress. So why don't we make that our aim and our goal this week uh, and and forever? to, To show the wisdom of God in the way that we live our life. And as well to show the wisdom of our parents in the way that we live our life. If there's anyone here this morning that has yet to be put on Christ and baptism, you are part of the church. The Lord hasn't added you to the universal body. We see in Acts chapter 2 that as many that were saved, the Lord added to that body, the church, right? And if you're not part of that, the heavenly beings, they don't see you and they don't see the wisdom of God. If your mother is one of faith and your father is one of faith and you've yet to be added to the church, do people see the wisdom of your parents in you yet? They don't. But it certainly can manifest itself. And starting today, people can say, you know what? I bet your mom was real proud of you. I would love for someone to come forward this morning and put on Christ in baptism. What I would ask that is after they did, that you wouldn't go up to them and say, your mama would be very proud of you and just end it right there. Again, it's a conversation killer, but you can say, I bet your mother would be proud of you. I was baptized on Mother's Day. Uh, My mom texted me this morning and said, hey, this is the first time in a while that May 13th fell on a Sunday, which was Mother's Day. You were baptized that day. You know what I heard that day a lot? Oh, your mother would be proud. I think I did make my mother proud. I think I did. So why don't you do the same thing if you will please come forward as we stand and as we sing.